everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Kaylee. I work for the U.S. Center for Mental Health and Sport. Um, today, we're having a, a little interview with the uh, sports psychiatrist, Mark Allen, um, on body image. Um, so really excited to have you listen in on this interview, and uh, I'll let everyone else introduce themselves. Hey, y'all. I'm Sean Callahan. I'm an intern with the organization. I'm a senior at Clemson University and really looking forward to this interview. I'm Brianna Mako. I'm also an intern for this organization. Um, I'm a junior at Clemson, and I'm also really excited to see where this goes. Cool. And thanks so much for having me. So I'm Dr. Mark Allen. I'm a sports psychiatrist based out of uh, Denver, Colorado. I, uh, my business is Peak Sports Psychiatry, PLLC. i um, done some work with U.S. Center for Mental Health and Sport and look forward to cont continuing to work together in the future. What led you to specialize in sports psychiatry? That's a that's a good question. Well, hi everybody. So so yeah, I'm Mark. Uh, so I I decided to go into sports psychiatry long ago as a medical student. I'd gone to the uh, American Psychiatric Association's annual meeting, and I was trying to find like my tribe, people that also in, in, enjoyed sport, but really just to see if I clicked with many people. Cause I, I, at the time being a medical student and thinking about mental health as a career, I was having to get over the stigma myself of going into be, becoming a mental health practitioner. And so I ended up looking at the back of this APA manual and finding this meeting at, a, at the end of a long, dark hallway. And there were 30 nerds talking about sports. And I was like, Oh my God, I found my people. Um, anyway, it was, it was uh, immediately I knew what my, like this was going to be my track. And I, uh, decided to join the International Society for Sports Psychiatry, the ISSP, which at the time really didn't have any like embedded curriculum. So what I ended up doing is if I did a general psychiatry residency at the University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio. I did a, a fellowship at New York Presbyterian in uh, New York City, Columbia and Cornell. And I did a post-grad year in New Zealand and came back and I was trying to figure out what I really wanted to do with the rest of my career. So one day in the summer, I decided to look back at that old ISSP website, and lo and behold, they had a curriculum, something that I could do for additional training. And so I pursued that. The International Olympic Committee had come out with their own uh, diploma course for mental health and elite sport. And so I, I did everything I could to actually kind of get that like final stamp of approval. But I've been wanting to, to work in sports medicine for years. I had a, a family member who was a, an orthopedist. Um, now, mind you, that was not my jam. I always liked being around the locker room. I played sports myself as a kid, uh, but you know, my 78 mile an hour fastball wasn't going to get me to the major leagues. I always wanted to be around uh, sport, and I always enjoyed you know coaching and being a referee. So one of the things I had in common with uh, Margaret and Sky was that I had refed, you know, kind of low level FIFA. I didn't make it to like what they were doing with like the World Cup or anything. But anyway, it's it's fun. I get to work with athletes. They tend to be a great population to work with. Unfortunately. Athletes uh, do have a, a prevalence of mental health issues, just like the general public, and then some, especially in the area of eating disorders. So I know we're talking about body image today, so that tends to be a pretty hot topic. Is that helpful? Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, with that, you do say you work primarily with athletes, of course, but how do you assess the mental and emotional needs of those athletes that you're working with? Great, great question. So whenever I meet a young athlete, I still want to you know, think of them as the, uh, the person who, t who is participating in a sports environment. So you still would want to do a, a very good, thorough diagnostic interview from everything from and checking in about all of the uh, potential signs and symptoms of, of depression and anxiety and mood disorders and disordered eating and substance use and yada, yada. But then think about the, the sports space specifically, because uh, most of the athletes I work with, yes, they're adolescents, but they then still have uh, an entourage of people that, that work around them. So it's not just their family. It's also the coaching staff. It's their teammates. It's it's uh, the officiant, if, if, uh, the officials. And then the, if they happen to work for or participate in a league, then there's the organizational po politics and stuff. That you have. All this stuff has to be factored in to this one individual. So just as when I as when I work with a kiddo, I can't I don't treat a child in a vacuum, I treat a family. I treat an athlete, I don't treat an athlete in a vacuum. I, I think of them in the in the uh, a larger scope. 
So I, I want to make sure that um, I'm keeping them in mind, but also treating them as a person. So you want to individualize care and, and take them aside. So you you do want to see like how is their sporting experience? You know, you want to see how far they've gone in their sport, what their goals are for the future, and maybe what's holding them back. And then that's that's kind of like the chief complaint. Like, how'd they get to your office? How'd they find you? Were they referred by themselves, the parent, the coach, the counselor? Had they worked with someone before? So depending on that information, how it comes to me, I can then steer the question. Yeah, they made a really good point. Sometimes we forget that these athletes are also people too that go through these everyday lives. Yeah, so well, what are some they, strategies? Well, if you think about it, they're they're a lot a lot of times they're thought of as superhuman. Right? Right. You know, what an athlete that's being revered for what they can do on the field, why would they have, you know, mental health concerns? Like they're 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 more than just human. No, well no. They're, there's people that are really good at sports, you know, but they they also can struggle with everything else other people can. So some strategies are to is, are to keep that in mind, keep the context that they are just people, but note that they are in a stigmatized world where it's not been okay to talk about your feelings. You you were always hard to talk to power through, and, and so the the language that's being used over the years in these different sports kind of suppressed coming forward with what might be bothering them at home that lo and behold might be affecting their performance. So if you, if you look at, if you look back in time, sports psychology has been around since the fifties. So it's, it's a very well entrenched special uh, specialty. And frankly, they've done great work. They've done a sort of a sideways approach to mental health because they have been talking about mental health without talking about mental health. And as time has progressed um, and Performance is always an easy thing to talk about because like with the on the field product is what people cared about, but it's the tip of the iceberg about how the individual is actually doing. So the mental health aspect has been more not in vogue, but finally being addressed. So the, so as a sports psychiatrist, which was a nothing word or phrase many years ago, um, that's that's actually the part of sports medicine that's lacking. It's the mental health aspect. So it's the whole person care that now can be delivered. Uh, to these athletes. I mean, if you look at a sports medicine team, it used to be led by an orthopedist, plus or minus a primary care sports medicine doc, some trainers who saw everything. Really, they're like the, the lifeline between the athlete uh, and, the, and the medical team. And they're the ones that knew usually how the person was doing, could maybe refer them for therapy. But now we have language that we can use and screening tools to actually assess how an athlete may be doing. So uh, one of my big passions recently has been trying to Make that an objective measure. It's not just a subjective, hey, you know, Johnny's struggling with depression. You know, and they also have he hasn't had scored a goal in X number of games. It's at the beginning of the season and at crucial time points in midseason, like during an injury. So a pre-participation exam, not calling it a physical, that's a misnomer. It, it shouldn't be called a, a preseason physical. It should be a pre-participation exam. Even the language matters there. So you would do something called a sports mental health uh, assessment tool, the SHMAT, which was developed by the IOC, or you can use another um, tool that was recently developed by UNLV, the MHDSIA, the Mental Health Disorders Screening Instrument for Athletes, I think is the, it's a, quite the acronym, but it still is a really good way to at least do as a check-in as part of the full spectrum of care. Depending on what comes up on that screening tool, you can then send them to you know get, get seen and then you would check in again mid season and then check again in the off season that kind of goes directly along with the next question that we have with you um so do you do that with every athlete on a team like do you or do you collaborate with specific coaches or like other staff members in order to get those athletes that sort of like training beforehand that assessment beforehand so m most of of uh, the screening process, for at least for my job, is 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 the education ed educational aspect to the uh, athletic departments and the teams themselves to just embed in their culture that it's okay to look for these things. And then once you do look for those things, be okay with then the answer that they may or may not want to see, which is, well, yes, mental health issues are going to exist on the team, and they may have to do something about. Um, and by the time they come to me, there's no there's no need to do a screening because I. 
I'm just going to be doing a thorough diagnostic exam and I'll be able to assess kind of what's where to go. But um, it's really important that on the front end that these screening evaluations are being done. And, and, I, and I do think that it is every day things are getting better, especially at, um, and within the pro leagues with their, as they're now building out mental health infrastructures and there's kind of mandates to at least have some kind of mental health practitioner embedded with the team. Now, it might just be a, a psychologist or, or an in-name in only uh, mental health professional that without really a, a requirement for a degree. I think what we will find is is more value is found from the performance aspect, thinking of the, that whole iceberg concept, that there will end up being more dollar spent, and then you'll have a more robust team that goes there too. Right. So that kind of leads into the next one too. I know a lot of athletes have performance anxiety. You know, they're not living up to their hype as a player. So when they come to you for that, what is your kind of process of just putting their minds at ease or just even helping them through that kind of situation? So um, performance anxiety is probably the most common referral that at least goes to sports psychologist where, you know, you can use um, all kinds of, of, of tools and tricks of the trade. It can be sports specific to kind of help um, reframe things in a process model versus a results model uh, in a, you know, working on breathing techniques, uh, thinking about what, what those cognitions are and like using a CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy approach to take out those, those negative automatic thoughts and replace them with more positive thoughts using positive psychology tools. Now, the, the time they get to me, but I would think that they probably will have tried some things. Maybe not. If they haven't, we'll do some, we would do some things in office to sort of reboot and, and, and address that anxiety when it comes on. Um, now, as, as I've said before, it may be more it, rather, rather than it just being like specific to going up to an at bat, like in baseball, um, or if you're about to take, um, you, you know, uh, take the podium or you're about to jump into the pool and you're feeling that flutters, uh, uh, there's a very helpful way of like reframing it. If you're feeling your sympathetic nervous system come on, you have to remind yourself it's because you care. There's never no reason to fear it. You don't, and you want to fight it, push it down. You're going to just embrace that it's there, use it to your advantage, because actually some anxiety is productive. Too much anxiety is not. There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, it's called the Yerk Dodson um, parabola. And so you actually kind of want to be in the sweet spot. So use a little bit of that to, to your advantage because of the, the your blood pressure is going up and your rabbit heart rate, your, uh, all, all of that, that fight or flight is actually delivering the blood to your extremities. So you can get, you can actually go, but then too much and then you get overwhelmed and frozen. So you want to avoid that freeze. Um, I'll work with folks on the yips. So like that, that whole, um, idea where you, you have an automatic block to an otherwise uh, um, automatic muscle movement where it's, it's like if you think you stink or there's analysis paralysis there's a lot of different ways you could look at it but for whatever, for whatever reason if you struggle with throwing the ball from second to first base which would be an otherwise very easy tool you got to loosen it up you have to, it has to actually be done without thinking and there are some ways that you can run around it mind you I haven't talked about medication or maybe is there an underlying generalized anxiety or a trauma something uh, that's happened in the past that needs to be dealt with. Like all this stuff has to be explored in that context. Yeah, you said earlier, and I 100% agree that the stigma of mental health is arguably one of the main problems in today's society. So how do you feel like us as a, like how the society can help break down that stigma? What are ways that you believe that? Well, it, it's a it's a million dollar question. Um, the to me, it's just it's normalizing that everybody goes through uh, stressful life events and challenges. And so, while a lot of very, I, I think, I think that the stat one in five, the idea that you know twenty percent of people at any point could be struggling with a diagnosable mental illness. That's good to, to like make you aware. Of, oh, yeah, that's pretty prevalent. But reframing that that five in five people can go through stressful life events and challenges. And so it's not just the you're othering that one in five, but you know, four, four out of five of us are doing just fine. But but it's it's the 20% of you that are that are struggling. Mm. 
we all are in this together and athletes are not immune to it either. So if, making sure that athletes are reminding, you know, they can go through trauma, you know, you're losing someone, you're so loss, worse, so, you know, substance use can come on. I mean, like there, there's, there's things that can happen to anyone. So no one's immune. But the messaging that and, and normalizing as part of your culture, help seeking is okay. So one of the things that we find is that, okay, now an athlete recognizes that they have a problem. They need to know that it's fine to actually talk about it. So having a coach that's willing to listen and not, not be judgmental, not add advice. That's just, you know, blind, but actually being like, just being a listening ear and then a referral to, to a professional. But that's, that's where we need to go. And, and, and then not thinking twice or, thinking negatively that now the, the athlete's broken and shouldn't be on the team or per- participating, but actually having them involved in actually strengthening the, those social ties, which is so, so important because depression's isolating. Certainly anxiety can be isolating. Uh, and a lot of these people have a loss of control in their lives where maladaptive behaviors can erupt when they don't feel like they have control. But if you've already built up that, uh, that social network and structure, then it, it's much less likely to happen. Yeah, I think something in the field that we hear a lot too is like it's okay to not be okay. You know, I think just really highlighting that and hitting that's huge. So what are some of the biggest challenges that you face when it comes to being a sports psychiatrist? Uh, aside, aside from the obvious, getting people to understand what's the difference between a sports psychiatrist and psychologist and, and noting that you're, you're part of sports medicine team. But it's it's just in general, uh, just fighting the, fighting the stigma and making sure that it People know know we're available. Getting getting teams and organizations to buy in, and and think of the resources being important rather than just providing lip service to you know they put out a tweet during X Y Z Mental Health Awareness Month, but then not not really backing that up with you know, okay we're going to beef up our staff, we're going to do trainings on mental health, we're going to make sure that there's awareness and. Or in also making it a safe place to participate, because uh, I mean, like U.S. Safe Sports in the in the news a lot right now due to I think a lot of it's probably funding challenges and not having the 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 manpower to be able to investigate a lot of the stuff that's going on, but not sticking your head in the sand and thinking that well we ignore it <laughs> that they're they're really the mental health issues aren't actually there. So it, it, at this point, we're so early in the curve. We, it's it's about awareness and education and having a talk like this, I think, is super valuable to get people to realize that we we do. We, I'd love to move from the talking about it to the action, but unfortunately, we still are at the education step. Yeah, that also kind of goes a little bit into our next one being because we're at like the talking stage. Like, what are ways that you continue to do, like, research with, like, latest developments and stuff like that and actively work on implementing those? So that, that is a great uh, uh, thing to bring up. So we do need to have more of an evidence base on mental health and sport. And so there's there's actually the launch of a new journal, Sports Psychiatry. Uh, it's based out of, uh, based out of Switzerland. Uh at the International Society for Sports Psychiatry is also beefing up their research and, and having a call for papers uh, every once in a while and putting it in different journals. The British Journal for Sports Medicine has done a pretty good job with having uh, periodical uh, you know, mental health issues uh, where they can put in new research. Um, but I, th- I do think that that's something that can improve. The International Olympic Committee really took uh, the forefront on this issue. They developed a mental health work group, which meets regularly i think right now it's actually meeting at least twice a year and they're updating their policies and procedures about how uh, at, a, at the highest level how to provide enough support for their athletes and then to take them back to their home countries which then can develop that i took part in the, the mental health um, you know, diploma program which had participants from all over the world with uh, you know a variety of different training backgrounds you know especially you know depending on where they were in the world. Some things, especially with mental health, maybe more than just stigmatized, but maybe actually, you know, completely frowned upon. So it's 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 about expanding the culture, of working with where you are. Um, but I, I do think, at least in the United States, uh, we we do need to spend more time on on, on that research element. All the research is going to show that it's needs 
be addressed. <laughs> and then athletes, unfortunately, have a higher prevalence of eating disorders, some parts, some sports specific substance use, um, you know, depending on the sport gambling. Um, but l- luckily, it's a protective risk factor for, for suicide. I think there's that social element. Um, so. Yeah, I think it's really important to just continue being innovative with the field. I mean, there's so many different avenues we can go with it. Um, so you kind of briefly touched on this already. Um, when you assess an athlete's progression, you know, you kind of talked about checkups and stuff like that, the not physical, like a pre-exam, but is there any other ways that you like kind of just check up on them throughout the season? Um, I I tend to think, at least in, in my practice, I, I tend to have a, a pretty uh, pretty open door policy where they can check in in between appointments pretty easily i um, mean you know i have a patient portal where they can shoot me messages and whatnot I'm, i tend to be uh, very flexible with timing of appointments especially with the athlete population i mean already in the adolescent world those after school appointments are the, the most valuable because kids don't want to miss school much less due to parents but in the athlete world you have school probably if, they, if, if they're in school then you have practice so like, when are you going to see the athlete? You have to, you have to be very flexible. So if you're an embedded provider, it's easy. You can like see them in the locker room or whatnot. For my practice, I'm beaming to them. And depending on the time zone, I, I adjust. But, you know, weekends are not off the table. You know, I, obviously my wife is very understanding and I try to still have a home life and keep that work-life balance there. But I, I do care about my athletes. I want to make sure that they're, you know, um, their own needs are being taken. So as they ramp up for competition too, or when they're on the road, you got to do some planning for that. Um, but usually I'll maybe do a, a, a few more at a burst of sessions with both before and during, both before and after competition stay available if they need it. Uh, we got Olympic trials are coming up in March. So no doubt there'll be, you know, more need kind of in front of that. If that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Off season tends to be a, a time where um, a lot of treatment plans are developed when there's less day to day pressures, uh, especially uh, like like for example in, in baseball. Um, you know, some of those guys are you know at the, at the training center for ten hours a day, and they're exhausted and they don't really have time to to be thinking about a, something new or want or want to mess with their process. But in the off season, they have a lot more time, so that. Um, I already have noticed that there's need there. Yeah, especially with it being such an insanely long season and playing five games a week. Exactly, exactly. And then there's and then there's uh, the the, all the sleep and jet lag and the travel can can get the way. Mm-hmm. A little bit further away from the topic that we're going towards right now, but obviously there are a lot of people who are either involved in sports or involved in just mental health in general and have a huge passion for mental health. So like if there's someone watching this interview that has a passion for mental health, what is like the biggest piece of advice that you could give someone to further that passion? As far as pursuing mental health and sport as a career? Um, just, just in just... general, I guess, Um, whether that's mental health and sport as a career or just how to better use their knowledge that they have and put it into something that helps make a difference. I mean, I like the idea. I mean, I think the mission of the U S center for mental health and sport is perfect. It's, 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 it's approachable, provides educational seminars. It's a great kind of platform or jumping off point to getting more information on the topic. Um, Getting involved in a local nonprofit or local youth sports league and just giving time and then being an advocate for mental health issues that might be aware, just or just spreading spreading the word. Um, I, I know that certainly Dr. Donka, um, you know, will at these um, sports or uh, soccer competitions just have a booth, you know, make sure that they're there, not 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 trying to you no know, hand out a flyer to everybody, but just know that they're there. Um, now, if someone wants to know like specific organizations to look at, I think that the Aspen Institute's Project Play is doing wonderful work as it as it really talks about using youth sports as a development tool and helping, you know, there will be developmental stages of of actually participating in sports. So it's like getting exposure to 
lots of different sports at first and then over time you fine tune maybe to one that's your passion and if you want to continue going up that uh step you know gradated level of competition but doing it in a healthy way uh there's so they have they have a lot of research if you want to know kind of that that'd be a great place to go um and then there's there's different sports specific charities i mean athletes for hope does great work uh related to you know mental health awareness and you know depression and suicide prevention there's the trevor project which has done some stuff there's um Colton Underwoods Foundation that has done things for uh, the LGBTQ plus uh, community for for athletes. Uh, so it really did, kind of depends. It's out there. I, I do think that we just need to, um, you know, continue to promote. <laughs> yeah. So you know, in the world of sports, obviously there's a lot going on. It's a very crazy industry. Do you notice any trends in the world of sports that have been a common theme with athletes that you've worked with? Um, I even in the last five years, I think it the mental health and sport is a lot less stigmatized, still stigmatized, but a lot easier to talk about. It's constantly in the news. I think that a lot of that we think we can thank the, the COVID years for speeding. Um, the recognition of mental health issues in society, not just in sport. And so as a result, we automatically had to do something about it. Um, but I, th I think uh, the, D the DEI movement and getting equity in different places, but mental health parity in medicine has, has been useful. Uh, but certainly in sports medicine, it's just, you, you finally got remembered. Um, now, internationally, um, I think that what the IOC is doing at the behest of the athletes, almost like by, per their request, where they're doing research and they're folding in some, uh, you know, uh, protocols. So, uh, and, and they're constantly adding new areas, again, at the request of the athletes that haven't, has never really been dealt with. Uh, so, and so U.S. is taking the forefront, certainly in a lot of ways, but the world is, is following. We're not, we're not leaving uh, mental health conditions behind that's awesome. You pretty much segued right into our next question. Um, but obviously there are a lot of athletes from different cultures um, and backgrounds. How do you adapt your approach to working with those athletes um, that are maybe not necessarily used to having or asking for help with mental health problems in particular? Well, I have to be very mindful that I am a white cisgender male. And uh, that I have a different life experience and, and privilege than uh, maybe some of the folks that I, you know, I'm working with. And so can I have to check that at the door and recognize that the person I'm talking about may have a certain reaction to speaking with. That being said, know it just even being mindful of the differences that you have with the person you're talking with. I think that's a start. Um, but also knowing that you're not going to know what it's like to be in their shoes. And so you're going to have them tell their story, which is why the best thing that you can do as a mental health practitioner is to listen. And then based on how that conversation goes, then if they their needs require a different makeup of a practitioner, it'd be different cultural or what, whatever, um, then we can find them the, the right fit. So therapeutic fit is oh so important because the person's got to feel comfortable with, with sharing their story to really get anywhere. Uh, sometimes there's a lack of resources and just, we, just we, we, got, we got what we got. <laughs> So you, you, you have to kind of, again, meet them halfway. But as far as, far as like the, the, the different cultures that exist, especially like within the, the Olympics, you, you know, you have to accept the fact that um, different countries are different and they may, may or may not be as forward thinking um, or progressive with the way in which they view mental health. Um, I think I'd like to think that everybody will get there and, and, and not ignore it as a, key aspects to overall health and wellness um we but we can't force the issue um especially like not to, to use this in any way as, a, as a, a way to compare it but like when i've worked with folks that are victims of trauma it's on their timeline for how they respond to that and so they're they're the guide and you just have to follow them and, and provide them support along the way so yeah I mean, it's uh, it's a delicate um you know discussion yeah it can definitely go in many different directions 
Um, do you also find yourself like adapting your approach between like young athletes versus more experienced athletes, like younger, even collegiate level to like national level athletes? Yeah. I mean, at the basis, a lot of the, a lot of the, um, a lot of the elite athletes I work with, you know, they're just big kids. You know, they're, they're, they are, they're hopefully are participating in playing what they've always enjoyed and they got into it for the right reasons rather than fame and fortune. It's just, they're playing a silly little game. They might just be really, really good at it. So, uh, you know, and talking to them like that as if they're humans, cause they are, they're going to be much more easy, you know, much more easily connected. Uh, but also recognize when you're talking with someone who's at the top of their game, you know, there were took there were a lot of sacrifices, not just from, from themselves, but from other people. And and so, yeah, I do take a slightly different approach because there's also probably then an organization that they're working with or team. And then, then there might be some certain expectations about how that things go. So when you meet with them the first time, you have to kind of know all of that at first. Um, but before, you know, making sure that like, for example, confidentiality is important. A lot of athletes uh, don't necessarily want to see an embedded mental health provider on their team, they might prefer a parallel approach, uh, a person so that they can feel e extremely comfortable. That doesn't mean that the mental health provider working with the team isn't adequate at their jobs or in it for the right reasons or or anything. It's just, again, it, but it, it doesn't matter. It's the athlete's comfort level, whatever that means. Uh, now, with my kids, you know, as I said, I work with families. The, the the kid's voice is super important though. And I, I think that there are different aspects of competition that matter when you get to the elite level um, that may not be relevant at an early age. I just want everyone to have the opportunity to play sports. I mean, that's the, the reason why I have my coffee cup. This is like the, the original Olympic mission, all sports for all people. There's, there's not, there's nothing there. There should be no barriers to participation. Um, so, I mean, I just, you know, treat my kids. They just happen to really enjoy sport. And I want them to have a healthy, you know, lifestyle for the rest of their lives. So they're building this as a foundational element that's protective against depression and anxiety and high blood pressure and obesity and all those kinds of things. And it, it, it allows for socialization. So if you start them young, then they hopefully will grow into someone who thinks of it when they're older. And also all the teamwork aspects that come from being on a team early uh, could be useful later in life. You, you think of other people besides just yourself. Absolutely. I think that's really powerful. So uh, I think, you know, our September newsletter is centered around body image. So we had a couple of questions regarding body image and mental health. So could you just touch on the connection between body image and self-esteem that you see in your field of work? Yeah. Uh, bo body image is... It, so so commonly uh, you know addressed in, in the sports space i mean but if you think about it outside of sport uh, at least at least in women 80 percent of women have some kind of body image distress just in general which it seems like just it's just so mind-blowing but it, but it's it's real and now you know with with social media and, and social comparison online it's just fuel it's constant it's always there so it's something you have to keep in mind now in the sports space when you have um, some sports that are even graded by aesthetics, like by the way people look, that like that's like a subjective element that's being objectified. And that 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 can be a real stressor. So when you know, for like gymnastics, uh, that that could be just it's just fuel for the fire though, for what could happen with body image distress. Um, I think rather than just the, the the talking about stats and stuff, I think it's really important to to look at what can be done. To, to improve um, the, the body image and the athletes that, that I work with, like making sure that the team culture is one that use, uses helpful language and doesn't just talk about like competition for thinness uh, or, or having like public weigh-ins or using that as bulletin board material, but having very mindful discussions about, you know, body weight and shape, but, but also not focusing on that number so much or, or that the way people look at has nothing to do with their speed on the field or when someone loses their period it's not a badge of honor to wear 
that you know that now they know that they're going to be a better runner. Well, actually, that's completely false. Like those who have amenorrhea don't swim nearly as fast as those who maintain their period, and that's been shown in a study. Um, I, 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 I mean, we could go a lot of different directions with this, but I, I, it's it's a hot button topic, and and I do think that there needs to be more education, especially to coaches. Yeah, 100%. You kind of touched on the majority of what we had on body image left. Um, but specifically in social media, what role do you think that that plays when it comes to body image with athletes? Well, in general, um, social media is like there's a, there's a clear correlation to, to between the advent of social media and the development of, of eating disorders. So if you look at Fiji, before they had the cable television, they had basically no reported eating disorders. Mind you, it, there wasn't really any studies that were done there. But it's, they did look that after the yeah, advent the cable television that was there, they found that eating disorders within that country matched that of the Western world. So it's, just, it's simply like an on-off switch. So there has to be this social element as well, like social comparison piece to, to um, what that does. I... I mean, I, I see it all the time. I find that social media can be a negative echo chamber where, pe where people just put on false fronts, of, like there's their online identity and then there's their true authentic self, which they may hide or, or not ever really share. And especially after COVID, when people have, in order to get that crucial social connection that is so vital to being human, they ended up kind of overdoing it online. And now it's like hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube. Um, you know, you know, post what I'd like to think is post COVID, you know, launching kids back to school has been hard enough, but certainly getting kids off of technology, which is only becoming more and more and more ingrained in the culture with AI and stuff that's coming. Um, I just would strongly recommend that people need to check their social media usage and make sure that it's more positive than negative. They should use diaries, you know, on how they feel before and after they've used it for a period of time. They should really monitor the usage. There's really no value to, to using social media more than you know an hour or something a day and no, there's actually negative correlations between what you use more than x number of hours and can't quote you the data right now but um it's it's tough <laughs> yeah absolutely i think it's a common thing that we keep seeing popping up you know just throughout the industry and that is all the questions we had for you today uh we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us yeah. Wait, well, thanks so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. And I'm really glad uh, to, to support the mission of the U.S. Center for Mental Health and Sport and look forward to continuing to work with y'all.